Welcome to the Meditation Podcast. You can find all our episodes on meditationpodcast.org. We're also on BitChute and YouTube, and you'll find the links in the podcast description. My four other podcasts, the Awakening Podcast, the Meditation Podcast, Speaking Podcast, Learn Polish Podcast, and the Crypto Podcast, as well as I'm a podcast coach now, so you'll find it all on RoyCollin.com. Today, my guest in Pennsylvania, in the US of A, please welcome Rich Lewis. Great. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. No problem at all. So I know you're an author of a book, but you might let the audience know who's Rich. Sure. Um, Rich is maybe the more recent Rich, I, I guess you could say. Over, I've been practicing a, a form of meditation, silent prayer called the centering prayer, which is meditation and a relationship with God. So maybe this is the newer Rich, even though the, the Rich you're speaking to is 55 years old. Um, th this Rich discovered centering prayer in late 2013, and it's really changed and transformed and healed my life. So I, we can talk a lot about that as, as we have our conversation. But um, so... Uh, I have a site called silenceteaches.com that's about five years old. I have a book that came out in August of 2020 called Sitting with God, A Journey to Your True Self Through Centering Prayer. And then I do a lot of uh, either guest speaking, coaching one-on-one, -on -one, as well as um, meeting with church groups. A lot of different church groups will have adult faith formation classes, and they want to learn more about centering prayer. So I'll come in via Zoom and, and talk to them. So I've been spending, I guess, at least since I've been practicing centering prayer, I've been sharing it with as many people as I can, whether it's through my book, through one-on-one -on -one coaching, and through speaking, and, and, and as I get asked to speak at different church groups or, or different types of groups. So you might tell me your journey. Is it something you've created yourself or just something that you became aware of? Um, I guess I became aware of Centering Prayer in late 2013. I was reading a book called Healing the Divide, Recovering Christianity's Mystic Roots uh, by Amos Smith. And as I was reading the, the Kindle version of the book, he talked about a practice called Centering Prayer that he had been doing for 15 years up until that point. And that immediately piqued my interest because I knew that silence was powerful. I just didn't know what to do in the silence. I didn't have a practice. I didn't know how you sit in silence. So I began practicing centering prayer, reading other books about centering prayer by other authors. And I reached out to Amos and we had back and forth email, email dialogue. And then we became friends. So actually, initially, I, I was working with him off of his website until my site was created about five years ago. Um, actually, I still have content on his site and I, my weekly meditation on my site goes out on Mondays and it continues to go out on, on his site. So it was really... Amazon introduced me to Centering Prayer through, through that book, and then my friendship with Amos, he, he challenged me to write my current book. He had, he had that book out, and he was in the midst of writing another book, so he, he kind of nudged me and encouraged me to write a book. So a lot of the things I've been doing right now were because people have asked me. So Amos said, you should write a book, and I took him up on it. Um, a couple of years back, a, a lady at my old church moved to another church and she said, why don't you come to our church and teach us centering prayer because I know that you um, practice it. And I had never thought of even doing that. So I, I put together a PowerPoint presentation and went off to that church. This was pre-COVID. So, and then I realized now I have something portable that I can do in person and or via Zoom. And then the coaching was just something I enjoy meeting with people one on one, working with people one on one. So I simply just took a chance and put a tab on my website and said I do coaching. And lo and behold, people began reaching, reaching out to me. So some of it was just me deciding to try it. And some of it was people asking me to, to do things. It, that's how I've been doing many of the things I'm doing now. Excellent. So you might let me know what is centering prayer. So Centering Prayer, um, Centering Prayer has been around for 50 years. It was actually created by three Trappist monks in the early 1970s, so three Catholic priests. They saw the other forms of meditation happening for, I guess, the non-Christian community and wanted something for the Christian community. So one of the priests, Father William Manager, was reading a 14th century book called The Cloud of Unknowing. And as he read this book, kind of a method of wordless silent prayer seemed to jump off the pages. And he began dialoguing with the two other you know, monks. And together, they, they created centering prayer. So centering prayer really is considered two things. It is considered meditation. 
but it's also considered a, a relationship with God, a way to open to the presence and actions of God within. Um, and how you do it, I'll, I'll quickly say, is you, you sit comfortably with your eyes closed. To begin your silent sit, you introduce what we call a sacred word. It's usually one or two syllables, so it could be God, a color, ocean, Jesus, and that signifies your you're opening to the presence and actions of God within you. And then as you're sitting there, as you begin thinking about the past, or you begin planning what you're going to do after your sit, you realize you're no longer sitting with God, you're sitting with yourself and your thoughts and your planning and plotting. So then you reintroduce that sacred word to come back to the present moment and the purpose of your sit and let go of your engaged thoughts. And then you even let go of the sacred word. So you really just use that word when needed, just to keep bringing yourself back to the, to the present moment. And you do that when needed. Sometimes you don't need it and you catch yourself. Other times you realize, there I go again and you kind of reintroduce interiorly that, that, that word. So that's, that's essentially, I guess, a quick history of a 50-year-old practice. Three Trappist monks created it. And then um, also about 10 years after they created it, the Contemplative Outreach Organization was created in 1984. So there's a website called contemplativeoutreach.org that is really the main centering prayer organization with a ton of resources. It shows events that are happening. It shows groups that practice really all over the world. So in the US, in the various states, as well as internationally in any of the countries, if there are groups uh, that practice, whether in a location or via Zoom, you, you can find them on, on that website as well. And like, I, I believe that the church is kind of against meditation from what I've heard. Yeah, it's like they kind of look at it as you know, not, not in prayer as such. I mean, I'm, I, 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 I'm totally in favor of meditation and I like what you're saying as well to keep focused on a certain word, whether it's the ocean or your own beliefs, whether it's Jesus or God. I mean, I, everybody to their own, I, I you know, I, I don't judge anybody for their belief system. I think it depends because, for example, um, here, I like obviously in the U.S. where I've tr reached out via email to try to talk with churches and see if they're interested in me talking to, to them. The churches here that have been most open to it or me coming in um, were Episcopal churches, Lutheran churches, United Church of Christ um, were really the main Try to remember if there's another one. It was Lutheran, Episcopal, United Church of Christ, and Presbyterian really were the main four, at least as I did my outreach to various denominations. They were more receptive of it, you know, ex responding to my email, to talking to me, and having me come in. Um, so I think you're right. I think um, some denominations are wary of it, and, uh, and others, if I'm not. I'll just say it, one of them, <laughs> I'm not going to come into their church. Like, it, I'm not Catholic, and I'm nothing against the Catholics, but it, it would be hard for me to come in and speak to a Catholic church when I'm, when I'm not Catholic, so they may not be as open to me. And maybe someday in the future, that will happen, but I have reached out to some Catholic churches, and I have not been – they haven't told me no, they just haven't responded. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I think you're right. I think they're wary of it. I, I think the big issue is – they don't think of it as prayer, but, but what they don't realize is it really has this type of meditation has a rich tradition in Christianity going all the way back to Jesus. Like you have the Eastern churches and the Western churches and the Eastern churches um, are very familiar with it and, and do practice centering or silence in, in contemplative prayer, whereas the Western churches um, aren't as aware of it and don't realize it goes all the way back to Jesus and comes all the way forward and into the current times. And when, when you're teaching in, in this, then like, how are people embracing it? You know, because obviously some people wouldn't be familiar with that. Is it something, the feedback that you're getting and how they're reacting to it? I think an initial reaction is, you know, the idea of sitting in silence for a period of time can be daunting because it can seem like an eternity. So when I meet with a church and, and I give them an overview of centering prayer, we do we, we just do a five minute silent sit. So and most of the time people say it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Now, again, I'm not doing a 20 minute sit, but the, the, the a big reaction is it really wasn't as bad as I thought it was. It was not an eternity and it was kind of nice. 
So is kind of the initial reaction. And I tell people that are new to this, you don't need to jump right into 20 minutes. Just try it for one, two, three, four, five minutes and slowly work your way up um, to 10, 15, 20 minutes. But don't feel that you have to jump right to 20 minutes. And for yourself, because I believe, is it three times a day you do it yourself? At times I do. So I guess generally I practice as much as possible twice a day for 20 minutes. So my first sit is when I get up in the morning, that's the first thing I do before I begin my day. And then my second sit is usually in the early afternoon, but sometimes I, I flex it. So like right now work, I work, I've been working from home since uh, for the last two years. And actually at this point, I'm going to continue working from home, but work's been very busy and chaotic. So I actually have added a third set, but just shortened sit two and three. So they're, they're just shorter sets. So when life gets very chaotic, I actually will add a third set, but to shorten sits two and three. So, so I'll do a second sit still you know, in the early afternoon, and then maybe two hours later, I'll actually do a third sit. And what I'm finding is it really just helps me get through, <laughs> helps me get through the day. So many people would say, I don't have time to do this. I, I'm too busy. And I'll tell them, actually, it has a way of giving you back time when you slow down and it's just take, take the time to sit for, for 10, 12 minutes. You'll be amazed at what, how productive you are when you go back to your normal daily activities. Absolutely, absolutely. And do you do it with your eyes closed or with your eyes open? I do it with my with my eyes closed, but you can practice centering prayer and meditation, obviously, with your eyes open. So, so and actually, you know, I you know, I had mentioned the sacred word. That's really if someone's if you're more of an auditory person, people will use a word. I quickly found that I'm more of a visual person. So I actually picture an, an image in my head to come back to the present moment. But some people are fearful that they'll fall asleep, so they keep their eyes open and you can stare at a spot, you know, five or six feet on the ground. So, yes, you can practice with your eyes open. And I know people that do. Okay. And with like affirmations, then what's your thoughts on that? Um, I love affirmations. Actually, I, I think of them as, I guess, single sentence statements. They're, they're goals or things I want to accomplish in my life, whether it's related to my physical health, my mental health, my financial health, um, my family or, or hobbies or things I want to do or things for my children. So they're single sentence statements and that I like to I have a list actually on my iPad and there's the notepad section if you're familiar with the iPad and, and I have kind of a list of 10 or 15 affirmations that I look at really on a frequent basis. I actually like to read them before my centering prayer sits and I think of it as I'm sitting with God and I'm letting these affirmations brew with God and I'm just continuously looking at him to make sure do they make sense or these things I should continue to look at and focus on or should I eliminate them or tweak them so I'm a big believer in affirmations I think the more you do that um, it 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 happens in your outer world if you have that in your inner world something has to first be in your inner world be, before it be, be can can become part of your outer world and do you do it in like you say I'm in the present tense or the future tense because I've heard of people doing it different ways um, you know, I think if I think I do both, I mean, I guess I, I think I do both in all honesty, okay. and I, but I, I, I can see where it might, it, it may make more sense to say them as if you already have it instead of, I will have it because then maybe you're not sure you will, <laughs> but if you speak it more present, it's like, well, I already have this and then it's, but I don't think it matters, but I think, I, I think it's, I probably try to do more of it, think of it as a present moment. Yeah. And I know you actually practice gratitude as well as something I do as well, but uh, it's more in the, uh, before you go to sleep that you do the gratitude. Yes. I love the idea of every night. I, I don't think I hardly ever miss it. I just kind of drop to my knees and thank God. And I look back at everything, no matter what it was. And I'll thank God for the cup of coffee I had or the TV show I watched with my wife or the talk my son and I had or the walk I well, the walk I took that I enjoyed or the couple things I got done at work that really needed to get done so yes I, I love the idea of just reflecting back verbally I'm not writing it down I'm just speaking it out loud and, and thinking about all the little and small things that, I, that I'm really grateful for that happened that day 
I like to think if I go to bed with gratitude, it'll stay with me and I'll, and I'll continue to wake up with it. I, I want to go to bed with a, you know, a nice positive attitude as well as really just being grateful because we, it's something I think me and, and many people just forget to do how lucky we are at times and how grateful we are for the small and big things we have. Yeah, I believe what we appreciate, we attract as well because we're conscious right. of it. It's like, you know, the, you know, the affirmations is the same kind of thing. You know, we were aware of it, we appreciate it, and it keeps coming instead of just, you know, just assuming it's going to be always like that. And I, I believe that's. I, right. I've seen one of the videos that you've done. You were talking about uh, your your son actually had a play. I don't know if he's about 13, but you were talking about get, getting out of your comfort zone. Because I think no matter what age you are, because even with the public speaking, because I've got the, the speaking podcast as well. I mean, I was, I don't know, 45 or something before I kind of hit. <laughs> hit to, to start working on that but like it's what what you've noticed with your son I think it's worth sharing sure yeah I guess my son even though he was in the background he was doing the he was on stage crew so I guess he's in a, in a middle school here so that's a grades um, I guess the ages I think are like 12 13 and 14 year olds and for at least four months or so they worked on the production Annie. So there was actually obviously the, the people that were doing the, the kids that were doing the acting and had the actual roles, but then they had obviously a lot of things behind the scenes where they, they had to, the, all the scenery and the different props that had to be built. So my son was really part of the prop building, but it was just impressive. It was the, you know, I, I it was a th Thursday night, Friday, Friday night and Saturday afternoon performance. So we watched the Friday night performance and Thursday night we went, but we actually worked the concession stands just to help out um, for, for the refreshments and stuff as, as part of it. But no, it was just an amazing experience as I sat in the audience on Friday, that Friday night and watched them. I was, I was just amazed that these kids, it was a big auditorium. So I figured over three days, they must've easily a thousand people um, did it in front of and, and just, they were so confident in themselves. They they spoke, they sang, they danced, and they even had to interject comedy into it. So they hit their lines dead on and had the audience laughing. And it just totally amazed me when I thought about these are only 12, 13, and 14-year-olds and, and that they're clearly out of their comfort zone. And, and it just made me think of me or even many adults that maybe are afraid to get out of their comfort zone or, or perhaps don't have that confidence that these kids had. I mean, these kids had a bold confidence um, displayed on those Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, as well as the kids that work behind the scenes because the scenery was, was just amazing. The props were amazing. So it was just a really, it was a terrific show. And it was just, I was amazed what 12, 13 and 14 year olds could do. And obviously the, the help that they got, the, the, the directors and the different adults and teachers that were involved over that four month process, just, just to keep them engaged and moving forward and bring this thing to completion. No, I think things like that are fantastic for a child because one, the cooperation, because there's so many different parts that have to come together. As you said, the stage, put the stage together and then the people, you know, the singing and, you know, the acting in front of the audience. And I, I think they can apply that then later on. And it is such a skill set that it's a pity, like, I, I don't think we were doing that when we were younger and it was more of a kind of shaming people. And I just know from a load of the people that come on the speaking podcast, most people have had, a, you know, where they've been abused by teachers verbally that scare them into being on stage. Whereas at the end of the day, we should be encouraging the children to never fear anything because then they show their true creative self. Right, ex exactly. And the other thing that was neat was it was very inclusive. And what I mean, meant by that was there was within the, the cast, you know, some of them had kind of behind, they were in the scenes, uh, not necessarily with speaking roles, but they were in the scenes engaged that they had um, uh, some down, down syndrome children and autistic children, and they all were included in the play. And I watched them and they were just dead on. They knew what they were doing and they knew exactly when and where and how they needed to do their thing. So it was also very inclusive. They included everyone. If they wanted to be part of it, you, you were part of it. Brilliant. Brilliant. So you might tell me a bit more about the book, what kind of chapters you've included, what you're covering in it. Sure. So Sitting with God, A Journey to Your True Self Through Centering Prayer um, came out in August of 2020. As I mentioned earlier, Amos Smith actually nudged me to write write the book as we be, became friends because he thought I had something important to say. So I, I took him up on it. And, and the book itself 
um, obviously talks about what is centering prayer. So, and it's 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 written as a non-academic book, very easy to read book. It's really for beginners, but as well as for people that have been practicing centering prayer and kind of help them go deeper in their practice and live from their true self. And then in the book, I just share a lot of my own journey and story to share how it is, how the practices healed me, transformed me, and kind of showed me, you know, how to live and how to, and, and to continue to live in, into the future. And then in the book, it's so the book obviously talks about centering prayer, the fruits of centering prayer, um, talks about your true self. Um, Jesus is important to me. So I, I have a chapter on, I, I took a look at what, what, what do the scholars, what can they say about the human Jesus that they think is true? So I, I hit some of that in, in one of the chapters. Um, and then really it ends with, you know, this has been so healing and transforming to me. I simply want to share it with others as, as my path and challenge people to try it and or even just try to find a contemplative path that will work for them and dig deep in that well. So the short chapters, um, as you look at the book, the chapters are short, made easy to read, um, questions for reflection, discussion at the end of each chapter, if you want to look at them and kind of reflect back. And then even within each chapter, you have a heading. So you know what to what you're going to read for the next one or two pages before you get to the next heading. So I wanted it to be a very easy to read book. I like to read in chunks. So I love when there's headings and I love when there's not a whole lot of pages between headings because I, I like to read in chunks. Doesn't mean everybody does, but for those that like to read in chunks, I, I hope that helped them. No, well, I do as I prefer that as well. So. Yeah, definitely. Which the true self then? What 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 do you touch on that? Sure. So the true self um, for me is the person God wants you to be, and that's who I connect to during centering prayer. Because with centering prayer, we use the sacred word to let go of our thoughts and continuously open to the present moment. So with center with centering prayer, we're really letting go of who we are not, so that who we are can can come out and flourish. And if you think about it, I mean, the letting go we do in centering prayer follows us outside of centering prayer. We let go of thoughts that harm us. We let go of things we tell us that aren't true, like such as I'm, uh, you know, I'm not confident when you you can be confident, or I'm the wrong person for that task. To know you're the right person for the task, or I'm too young to do that. No, you're perfect age, or I'm too old to try that. No, just just try it. So, centering prayer really has helped me let go of harmful thoughts that really aren't true and just grow and become who, who I should be, and, which is a journey. It's, it's never, my true self is not an end point and I've hit it and congratulations. It's, it's a continuous journey while I'm still alive on this earth to, to grow and, and flourish and, and do the things that, that can help people and, and make me feel alive at the same time. And with like the meditation centering prayer, when you're thinking of something, because obviously, you know, your belief system, you're in the positive mode, you're thinking, whether it's the ocean, whatever it is, you're in the pure, and you can't have two emotions at once, you can't be thinking negative. And even if you're coming from a place of negativity, and you go into this, and you stay focused, you don't come out of it, and then go back into ne negativity, I think your, your, your mindset shifts and that you're in a better place. And it's just a case of building, as you said, you know, you don't have to do the 20 minutes. If you find that your head is all over the place, just say, okay, let's try to do it for three minutes and just build on it. And you find it. it's like anything else. It's a muscle memory that you actually start building. Exactly. So, I mean, it, the gesture of letting go kind of follows you outside of the practice. You learn to let go of what doesn't, what the present moment doesn't require of you and hone in and focus on, on what it does. And, and then even the practice itself seems to grace you with, with fruits. Uh, and, and each person that practices really any type of meditation probably can tell you how it's graced them. So for me, you know, it's, it's in, kind of infused me with an excitement for life. It's, it's infused me with confidence that I didn't have before. You know, it's infused me with really trying to be more present for the situation and what it requires of me, uh, even if it's I'm listening to someone, giving them the full attention and listening to them and not thinking about what, what I'm going to say. Um, and it's infused me with confidence to move out of my comfort zone and just try and, and do new things. And it's also helped me just, I'm work in progress, but I'll panic and get anxious. And then, it, then I can say, stop that. And I can let go of that and move forward. So I think prior to centering prayer, I would probably stay anxious 
a whole lot longer as a result of centering prayer. I can immediately recognize these are thoughts I'm feeding myself, let them go. I don't need to be anxious and I, and I can kind of let go of the, the worry or the fear or the anxiety and realize those are just thoughts. That's not who I am and that's not what I'm capable of doing right now. I suppose when a lot of people would face the anxious, you know, kicking in would be when you're speaking in public. So when you've been going around promoting this, I suppose you might tell us to, at the start compared to when you've done a few of them, you know, what you learned and better ways of connecting with the audience. Um, you're right. I mean, I, I think as you keep doing it, you get better and better at it. So I think you just, it's hard. You, you just have to elect, like it, when I first started, I felt like I, you know, I needed a script. I needed to know exactly what I needed to say because I was nervous. But as you kept doing it, you realize you, you just have to let go and you might have a, you might have a small script or, or bullet points of what you want to say, but if you just let go and trust the words, the words start coming out. Like an example, I'll give. I give. I give. You know, I've done a lot of talks to small and medium-sized groups, but I did one in January that was 400 people. So, as it as the day approached, I began getting anxious, thinking, "Oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? 400 people." And then I'm like, no, "I'm having all this internal talk." Then I'm thinking, "Rich." It's the same thing as speaking to 10 or 25 people. I'm, I'm going to do the same talk. It's going to be the same thing. And I, I did calm myself down. And I did a short meditation even before I went live. It was a, it was a one hour talk. And I was fine. And I guess what and it, and it was tough, too, because I had to have a one hour talk. So I put together my talk. I, I remember putting it together. And then I remember practicing it. And the first time I practiced it, it was 30 minutes. And I thought, that's good. I got I got to fill another 20 minutes or so at least. So I kept, you tell, I guess you begin to tell story. I mean, I think that's what, I, I think that's what, I think that's what makes it better when, when you're talking, if when you're telling, you're not lecturing, you're giving them personal experience, you're giving them story, you're sharing your own experience and then adding more story to it and giving live, you know, things that have happened to you. So I think that's maybe the, the thing that I try to do as much as possible is, is really share more of me, share more of my journey, share some personal stories, whether it's me or something with my son or something with my daughter or, or some unique story that I think that it'll help people. So that, I guess as I continue to speak, I think the more story you can tell and draw people in, the, the better it will be. Absolutely, absolutely. And just finally, on the coaching, I, I know you, you like the coaching kind of came later, but is it kind of centered around that or have you got a few kind of uh, areas in the coaching that you're doing? Um, with the coaching, I know, and it's funny because people will they'll say you should have an avatar and this is the type of person you should coach. And I think I really, and I, I probably blow that model. I, I have three, I guess you could almost say sometimes I really have three avatars because as I look at the different type of people I've coached, they fall into one of three categories. One is they're brand new to this type of practice and they really want someone's help and they want someone to, they want someone to teach them and hold them accountable to the practice and, and help them get through any barriers that stop them from the practice is kind of one group of people that I've, that, that, that I've coached. A second group is people that are already practicing, but they feel that they're still skimming the surface. They're, they haven't added a depth to this practice that, that they know exists. And are they really living from this, this self, the true self? Are they, re, are they really living from the depths of who they are that they could be is really the second type of person. And then the third type are clergy, people that realize, you know, I'm, I'm at a church or, or, or I am in ministry serving people, but I'm doing a lousy job of my own self care. And I, and I want your help to create a practice and take better care of myself, or I'm going to be of no good to the people that I'm, that I'm serving. So I've, I've coached all three types. As I, as I look back, it they, they fall into one of those three categories. So, so I don't, I don't want to limit myself to say I only coach new people or I only coach clergy or I only coach people that have already been practicing. I kind of let it let it happen and see see where they land. And who knows, maybe in a couple more years, there'll be a fourth group. <laughs> Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Listen, Rich, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. You might let people know how they can get in contact with you. 
Sure. The best way to find me is silenceteaches.com, my website. Um, I have a free ebook on my site. So when they subscribe, they'll get a free, very short ebook that shares what Centering Prayer is and, and how you do it. And then if, if it, that further intrigues them, they can check out my book, which is also on my website. Excellent. Okay. So I'll make sure I put the link on both the audio and the video. Thank you very much, Rich. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. No problem. So that's all for the meditation podcast. You'll find all our episodes on meditationpodcast.org. As mentioned, we're on BitChute and YouTube. Sure to give us a thumbs up, five-star rating, subscribe. It all helps. Until next week, take care.